This series is designed for policymakers and their staff, as well as members of the public, to gain up-to-the-minute insights and analysis from Johns Hopkins faculty experts. In today's briefing, we're going to focus on the latest developments related to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of your screen. For today's briefing, I am fortunate to be joined by four guests, all of whom are leaders within the Coronavirus Resource Center team. Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She serves as the epidemiology lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center, and today she's going to discuss trends that we're seeing in the COVID-19 data, as well as the path forward. Dr. Bill Moss is Executive Director of Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He serves as the vaccinology lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center, and he's going to provide updates on the latest COVID vaccine developments today. Dr. Brian Garibaldi is medical director of the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit at Johns Hopkins Medicine and is an associate professor of medicine at Hopkins. He's the clinical lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center, and he's going to discuss clinical and therapeutic developments relative to COVID-19. Finally, Beth Blauer is associate vice provost for public sector innovation and the data lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center. Beth is going to give an update about demographic data during the pandemic, both what we know and where the gaps are. I'm now going to turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview, and then we'll move into Q&A. Jennifer, first to you. We're starting to hear a lot about how the U.S. may now be turning a corner from the Delta surge. Do you think that's an accurate characterization? Yes, thank you so much, Lainey. Um, hopefully everybody can see the slides I have here. Um, I come bearing some um, cautious optimism, which is that uh, now for several weeks, we have been seeing a um, sustained declines of, of cases in the United States. That said, there have been so many grim milestones in this pandemic. I have to acknowledge um, that the United States uh, just uh, met yet another one, which was we've now exceeded 700,000 deaths, um, people who have lost their lives um, to this virus. So that's just should put into perspective the incredible tolls and, and very much um, the work um, that still needs to go on. Um, though our case numbers are declining now and have been for a, a number of weeks, um, we are still at dangerously high case numbers, which you can see from the upper right-hand corner uh, of the slide. Uh, we are several hundred thousand, you know, several hundred times um, higher than um, than where we were uh, in, in June, which was our, our lowest amount of, of case numbers. Um, but the situation in many states is improving. Um, this is a map that I look at in order to uh, understand uh, what the current case trends are in each state. And you can see, I like to see a lot of green. Um, and um, several weeks ago, most of this map was red, meaning that the majority of uh, states were reporting case increases. Um, but now we're seeing um, considerable more uh, green, which is um, you know, uh, good news for sure. Um, there are, I will still point out, some, some states that are showing case increases, and um, those are, are currently on our watch list. Um, we are, what we're seeing right now is um, considerable regional variation, both in, in terms of um, COVID case numbers and uh, COVID trends. So what I'm showing here is an analysis that one of our um, Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center data scientist, Emily Pond did, where she looked at the COVID case trends by region. Um, as you can see, the South was really where we saw that precipitous uh, increase in cases. Um, fortunately, uh, the, the case increases have um, really come down. So the case numbers are coming down in the South, which is bringing down the, the U.S. Uh, case numbers. We've seen slight growth in, in other regions, um, the, the Northeast, the Midwest, um, and the West. Um, but as you can see, there, the, the increases in these regions aren't nearly as steep um, or as high um, as it was in the South. Um, we see similar trends in deaths. Um, with the difference between the South and the Northeast, Midwest, and West 
um, uh, much greater, uh, where um, uh, the death trends, um, particularly in the South, shot up quite rapidly and now are finally starting to come down. Comparatively, we've seen a very slight you know, a, a rise in deaths um, in the other regions, but not nearly as steep. And the reason for this is um, probably best demonstrated by the, the, the graph all the way on the right, which shows um, case trends um, in, in uh, states of different vaccination coverage. So um, in short, uh, states that have the lowest percent of their population um, vaccinated are seeing um, the highest per capita case increases. And with each um, bin of vaccination coverage, as vaccination coverage uh, increases, we see uh, case trends um, uh, much lower. So that I think is a good endorsement of the vaccine in terms of their abilities um, to reduce transmission, but crucially to, per to um, avert hospitalizations and deaths. Um, so because we are seeing a slowing of the cases, we are now finally starting to see a slowing in the um, uh, hospitalizations um, where we were um, really throughout August was very um, concerning levels of hospitalizations and increasing levels of hospitalizations really in all age groups for sure. Um, but, um, uh, you know, not all age groups have been hit nearly as hard. And I just, just have to point out that if you look at the right hand graph, the um, purple, dark purple line on the top is adults who are um, 70 years of age or older. And this really just underscores that age remains the single biggest risk factor for hospitalization and death. And that despite um, improved uptake of vaccines among uh, older age groups, um, we still have more work to do to protect people who are particularly at risk. Um, there may be a lot of homebound elderly and others who haven't yet gotten vaccinated, but very much need to um, because of their particular risks for, for winding up in the hospital if they were to contract. Uh, the virus. Um, kids have been in the news a lot in part because in August we saw a very, very concerning um, a rate of increase in hospitalizations among children. I'm glad to um, report that the, the data are showing improvement here now that we are in October. Um, actually, these data are from the end of, the end of September, um, where the hospitalizations in children have really come down quite a bit. Um, that is encouraging given that um, many um, in this age group, this is from zero to 17 years, are not yet eligible for vaccines. And um, what it seems to be driven by is uh, adult cases. Uh, we have seen time and time again that when adult cases rise, um, when the percentage of adults who are getting infected in a community increase, we see um, subsequent rise in, in cases in kids. Um, similarly, as we bring down cases in adults, we start to see a, a decline in cases in kids. And so what this means, I know many parents like myself are um, looking forward to the day when we can vaccinate our young children uh, who are not yet eligible. But it, what it also means is that in the meantime, um, we have much more work to do to protect children by reducing the circulation of this virus in adults. And I'll just end on this last um, uh, graphic from the uh, Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. Um, since really very close to the start of this pandemic, we have been tracking testing in the United States. And um, the testing situation is one that has never been fixed. Um, where we are today is that we are slowly, slowly, slowly starting to ramp back up testing. But where we were, um, you know, in July and August was a situation where testing was severely constrained to the point where our test positivity, which is a measure that we also track to understand if we're doing enough testing, um, was approaching levels that we hadn't yet, we hadn't seen since um, pretty much the, the winter surge of, of cases. So um, our test positivity is currently too high. Um, and that means that even though we've made some improvements in increasing tests and testing in the United States, we still have more work to do. We have to do more tests to cast a wider net to find infections are in the community so we can make sure everybody who knows that they're infected so they can stay home and not spread the virus to others so that we can count those cases and populate our surveillance so we know how much of a problem we have and that we can figure out where we need to target our resources in order to try to control this virus and, and put ourselves back on the path to normalcy. Testing is an important tool, even as we focus on get increasing vaccinations, which is, of course, a very 
um, uh, top is a top priority. Testing remains an important tool to know how best to target our our resources. And unfortunately, the testing environment is really um, critically strained right now. Um, there are many, many news stories about how people have not been able to um, access testing, that they are waiting way too long in order to get test results, that they try to go to the stores to buy rapid tests that were once, you know, an ample supply um, for purchase, and they can't find them. Um, but, you know, never mind the fact that these tests um, should never have um, uh, been sold at a high cost, they should have always been widely available and free. Um, I know that there is going to be more effort um, focused on this in, in the coming months, but I have to underscore the urgency. Um, you know, we can't wait months to have ample um, uh, access to testing. Uh, now is a really critical period to make sure we don't um, suffer uh, deadly setbacks in the control of this pandemic. And testing is a vitally important tool um, for uh, making sure that doesn't happen. So we need to uh, uh, make this uh, one of our top priorities. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And I want to remind those who are watching, please do submit questions for our experts to answer. I'm keeping an eye on those questions coming in and we will get to them shortly. Bill, I'm now going to turn to you. So we have one authorized booster, likely more on the way, rising expectations for a COVID vaccine for those in the five to 12 age group. So as we continue on into the fall, do you feel like we're going to be able to vaccinate enough of the population to limit disease spread? Yes, thank you, Lainey. Um, what I hope we can do is vaccinate enough people so that we limit severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths, and bring these death numbers, these, these death numbers that Jennifer talked about, uh, way down, and unburden our healthcare system. We, uh, Brian, can address this, but we've had uh, around the country, you know, hospitals that are overwhelmed. That's I, what I, what I'm hoping for. Whether we'll be able to actually reduce, you know we won't be able to stop transmission. We should be able to reduce transmission. Um, but we still have a long way to go, in, both in the United States and particularly globally, in terms of getting people vaccinated. So if we look at the proportion of people who are fully vaccinated in the United States, it's only 56%. Even if we look at those 12 and older who are eligible for vaccination, it's only two thirds. That's not enough uh, to limit uh, transmission. Uh, so we've got to do a lot better. Now, granted, some of those individuals who are unvaccinated probably had COVID and have some immunity to that. Uh, Jennifer showed numbers showing around 4 million cases uh, reported in the United States. Um, but there's a lot of heterogeneity as, as across the country, both spatially, as, as Jennifer showed, um, with some counties and states having very low uh, vaccination coverage, and that correlates with uh, cases and hospitalizations and deaths. Um, we also have uh, 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 heterogeneity across age groups. In the United States, 84% of individuals over 65 years of age are fully vaccinated. That's fantastic. That's where we need to be across all age groups. But if we look at the 12 to 15 year age group, um, you know, it's fewer than half, uh, maybe around 45% uh, are fully vaccinated. So uh, we have a long way to go. Our, this country has tried both carrots and sticks, including um, uh, incentives. Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, mandates, both in the public and private sectors that are having some uh, impact. But I want to remind everyone that 97% uh, or more of, of all deaths are occurring in unvaccinated. Now, big news about the boosters, as you alluded to, uh, Lainey, um, the, with uh, an FDA authorization and CDC recommendations for booster doses for individuals who receive two doses of the Pfizer vaccine uh, to get a booster dose with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, more than 6 million uh, additional doses have been administered in the United States um, and about 8.4% of the population older than 65. There's still a lot of uh, remaining questions around booster doses. Obviously, those of us, including myself, who received a Moderna or J&J &J vaccine are, are uh, anxious to hear about uh, the data and recommendations on booster doses. Um, the advisory committee to the FDA, the Vaccines and Related Biological Products ad, uh, Advisory Committee will be meeting next week, October 14th and 15th to discuss this. 
We still don't know the duration of protection following booster doses, and there's still a lot to learn about mixing uh, vaccine types. This has been another very common question, um, and uh, we're learning more about that. There are ongoing studies, but no recommendations yet. I know a lot of interest around children, and when are we going to have vaccines for those children uh, 5 to 11 years of age? Um, and so what we know is that Pfizer's out in front on, on this. They issued a press release on September 20th that showed uh, re good safety and immunogenicity data, meaning uh, immune responses. They compared uh, children in this 5 to 11-year-old age group with, with individuals 16 to 25 years of age, similar uh, side effects, very good immune responses, comparable immune responses. Then on September uh, 28th, they uh, submitted some preliminary data to the FDA, and so we're expecting uh, a full uh, application to the FDA, and then uh, hopefully a speedy review. Uh, a lot of people are still expecting that we'll have an authorization recommendations for uh, the Pfizer vaccine for children five to 11 years of age um, by the end of this month. Um, I'll just end up, uh, Lainey, that, you know, I, it's very important that we highlight the global inequities and in vaccine distributions. Um, particularly as we in, in the United States are so fortunate to be able to roll out booster doses and vaccines for children. Just a reminder, fewer than half of the people in the United States have, uh, I'm sorry, globally, fewer than half people globally have received a, a COVID-19 vaccine. And again, there's gross uh, spatial uh, heterogeneity with only about 7% of people in Africa having uh, had access to a vaccine. So the United States and global community need to do a lot more uh, to address this, these global inequities in vaccination. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to ultimately prevent transmission here in the United States. Thanks so much, Bill. And that's a, a critical reminder at the end about the, the, go the global community. Ryan, I'm going to now turn to you. So you've been on the front lines of this pandemic since its earliest days. What do you see as the key clinical or therapeutic developments to date and what might be on the horizon in the next couple of months? Well, thanks, Lenny. Well, a lot of things have improved over the last you know, 18 months in terms of the way that we approach the care, particularly of hospitalized patients with, with coronavirus. You know, thinking back to March of 2020, you know, if you were admitted to the hospital with COVID in some areas, the mortality rate was, you know, upwards of 20, 25%. And, and now we're really seeing a much better outcome for people who do get hospitalized with COVID. Part of that, I think, is, is our comfort level of being able to, to move and maneuver in these, what we call bio mode environments, where we're wearing special protective gear, but we're able to actually provide the level of care that we can provide in other areas of the hospital. That took some time for us to get used to. Uh, part of that is also who's getting admitted to the hospital. You know, back in, in March and April of 2020, we obviously saw a lot of patients with significant comorbidities, particularly people from nursing homes who were getting admitted to the hospital, and they had a very high mortality rate. Uh, but there certainly have been important changes on the therapeutic front. Um, I do want to highlight, even before we get into therapeutics, though, that a lot of the gains that we made in terms of that ability to maneuver in these environments and, and providing the standard of care that we would expect for any patient with a respiratory viral illness, um, we're not able to do that in areas of the country that get overwhelmed with cases. And, and as, as Bill alluded to, there have been several areas of the country that have actually had to institute crisis standards of care and have had to allocate critical resources like ventilators, uh, like access to certain medications. Um, and there's also been a, a particularly important problem in terms of staff shortages. Uh, um, you know, frontline nursing in particular is something that's been very hard to come by as people have been overwhelmed, burned out, uh, moved on from their nursing careers, or just simply not had enough people in a particular area to provide care for patients. So when we've heard about hospital beds that are closed, sometimes it's it's not a physical bed that's missing. It's actually the the critical staff that are needed to provide safe care to patients in those beds. Uh, so I think that's really important and that underscores the importance of the message we've heard today, which is we need to do whatever we can to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, you know, for hospitalized patients, we now have an evolving standard of care where we use routinely a medicine called remdesivir, which is an intravenous uh, antiviral therapy, which was shown in a large clinical trial to reduce the time it takes for someone to get better. But as real world effectiveness data has emerged, uh, we've also potentially seen uh, a, a, perhaps a mortality benefit in, in patients who are not quite as ill when they first get remdesivir. 
Uh, we've also started to understand better how to use anti-inflammatory therapies like dexamethasone and tocilizumab and baricitinib. There have been very large, well-done studies showing a mortality benefit in shutting down the, the robust immune response that some patients will get that ends up uh, causing particularly lung injury and, and uh, inflammation in the intensive care unit. I think equally importantly, we, we've also learned what doesn't work. Uh, so, you know, medicines like hydroxychloroquine, which have been used uh, uh, after some initial case reports have come out of France in, in early 2020, um, we now know that that medicine does not work. It doesn't prevent disease. It doesn't treat disease. It has no, no role in, in, in COVID right now. And I think there's emerging evidence that other medicines that people were excited about, like ivermectin, which work in a test tube, really don't work to prevent illness or to keep people from becoming severely ill from COVID. And in fact, can have pretty significant side effects, especially when people are trying to get it uh, from veterinary supply stores or you know non, non-human formulated uh, versions of this drug. So I, I think it's important to recognize that we know what to use, but we also now know what, know not, you know, what not to use. Uh, there still remain questions about some therapies that have been widely available in use, such as convalescent plasma. Uh, the randomized control trials to date that have, that have looked at plasma have not clearly shown a benefit. Some retrospective studies have shown maybe there's a benefit if you use it very early at, at very high antibody titers uh, in certain select patients, but we still don't quite know um, what the true role of plasma is, and we're not widely using it in the hospital right now. There's a lot of excitement on the outpatient side uh, for treatment for patients uh, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. So we've seen an expanded use of monoclonal antibodies. These are um, medications that are basically replicate the natural antibodies that you would make in response to an infection. And we're able to give those to people uh, early on in their illness. Um, we've known for some time that if you give it to someone who's symptomatic and high risk, it reduces the likelihood that you're going to get so sick that you require hospitalization. But we've now seen emerging data that you can use these monoclonal antibodies as post-exposure prophylaxis. So if you've been exposed to someone who's a confirmed COVID case and you're high risk, we can reduce the likelihood that you're going to become ill by giving you these monoclonal antibodies. And we also now recognize that we can use this for, for people who are unlikely to mount uh, a, an effective immune response to vaccines. So we can give these monoclonal antibodies to try to prevent people from getting ill if they're not able to respond to a vaccine. Uh, probably the most exciting thing that we've heard about on the outpatient front in the last several weeks has been uh, news from Merck and Ridgeback that their oral antiviral medicine, Molnupiravir, um, they've submitted data to the FDA to, to ask for an emergency use authorization based on a phase two to three trial that showed a 50% reduction in the risk of hospitalization among a trial of about 800 people. Uh, we still haven't seen that primary data. It's with the FDA right now. We're, we're excited to, to get our hands on that data to see exactly how effective this drug is. But if we had the ability to give an oral antiviral agent uh, early on in somebody's disease course that prevents hospitalization, I think that would widely expand the access to these types of treatments and really help reduce the burden on, on hospitals uh, in areas where there's been uh, large surges of cases. And there are, there are other companies that are also working on um, additional oral antivirals, which I think might change our ability to, to impact that trajectory, particularly early on in disease. Thanks so much, Brian. And now I'm going to turn to our last panelist and then we'll move to Q&A. Beth, you have been immersed in demographic data throughout this pandemic, and we know that those data have the potential to give real insights about which groups are most vulnerable. So what have we learned so far from the demographic data? And perhaps most importantly, where do you see gaps? Beth, we're not able to hear you. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Lainey, and thanks, everyone. Um, I, I just want to, um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to talk a little bit about demographic data. Um, we've been uh, here at the Coronavirus Resource Center uh, working for the last several months on trying to parse and understand demographic data as it relates to COVID. Um, the initial uh, COVID data that we had been displaying in the CRC uh, was based on some prior work that was done um, by our colleagues at the, the COVID tracking project. And when they um, stopped sharing demographic data, we went in trying to explore demographic data. So why is demographic data important as it relates to COVID? Demographic data 
whether we're talking about the age of patients, the race of patients, the ethnicity of patients, gives us a wealth of information that can help pinpoint strategies for intervening early in communities, making sure that we're being very um, uh, specific about where we're communicating, making sure that we're creating targeted messages so that um, we can encourage populations to get vaccinated, to engage in the social uh, distancing and other mitigation activities that we know are most effective uh, throughout the course of COVID. Um, and without the specific information, we only knew anecdotally that there were disproportionalities on how COVID was affecting uh, black and brown communities. And so we started to go and and look at this data, uh, and what we what we what we understood was that we knew that there would be missing data. Uh, but I think the complications that were unveiled in this exploration were not just that there were missing data, uh, but in the absence of any standards on how local jurisdictions should be depicting their demographics, we saw a very wide range of information that was being released. So if a state was actually releasing the data, and you can see here, I've got the age category, and this is our new public, uh, publicly available uh, um, uh, explorer that you can um, get if you uh, click on the coronavirus jhu.edu uh, website, and I think we'll, we'll share a link. Um, and um, what you can see is that um, we can look at, for instance, age, and we can have a drop-down menu that has bandings of age, right? And so here you have um, a zero to nine, which is in the largely or in the completely unvaccinated population. So you can see how cases and deaths um, in testing, um, but obviously without vaccinations available, this whole map is blank. But what is also blank are all the other states in these areas that are not breaking down. So there are a number of states who are just wholesale not um, uh, providing demographic breakdowns of their data, uh, broken down by age, many also not um, sharing that data um, based on ethnicity, um, uh, the gender sex spectrum, and race, we are still very limited in understanding the impact of COVID um, in discrete populations and having this lens um, to really understand it as it relates to um, uh, these demographics. Why is that a problem? It absolutely um, is a problem because uh, we don't have um, a, a, the capacity to respond to this data in a way that can, again, pr provide those um, targeted communication strategies so we can go into communities. Uh, we've seen incredible work when local jurisdictions use granular demographic data like they do here in Baltimore. We've seen this in New Orleans and San Francisco um, and in many other cities where this demographic data is helping public health officials pinpoint and target where to deploy mobile units for testing, mobile units for vaccination, um, uh, messaging um, in multiple languages for um, just safe COVID practices. Um, without this granularity, we don't know how to target those messages. We can't formulate those um, uh, strategic public health um, um, average, and it's having a, a disproportionate effect on sort of the, the, the this last mile, the, the real work that needs to happen. Um, I just want to reiterate um, something that Jennifer said was, we are still deeply concerned about access to testing in this country, as we know we need testing um, as a critical tool uh, as we continue to navigate the disease. Testing has been the place where we have the most limited understanding of who has access to resources. Um, so from the very beginning um, of our tracking of this data, uh, testing has remained to be the sort of frontier where we're getting extremely limited data and information. And that's really, I think, um, a significant signal that it's it's we're not getting a full picture of who, um, who has had access to testing, uh, where we should deploy scarce testing resources, and where we really need to emphasize uh, the use of testing to understand uh, uh, the impact that COVID is having in local communities. Thanks, Lainey. Thanks so much, Beth. I'm now going to turn to the questions that have been coming in from those who are watching, and I want to thank everyone who submitted questions, and please do um, continue to submit to them throughout this briefing. I'm keeping an eye on what's coming in. So I'm going to start, Bill, with a question for you, and then, Brian, I'll give you a chance to, to weigh in as well. And this concerns a topic that, that we hear about a whole lot, which is natural immunity from those who know that they've had COVID-19 and what that means in terms of vaccination. So Bill, I was hoping you could talk us um, through the, the difference between yeah. immunity from having had COVID-19 versus um, vaccination. And Brian, if you could tell us the kind of advice that, that you offer to patients who are coming to you with this type of question. 
So thank you, Lainey. This is it's a very common and a very important question, and I can understand why this question is asked because we know people do develop immunity after natural infection. Um, so first of all, this the current CDC recommendations are that individuals uh, should be vaccinated regardless of whether or not they've had prior uh, COVID-19. Um, and this is because the, uh, the immune responses to natural infection are both uh, are variable, both in their magnitude and duration. Um, and so we don't really know in an individual, in a particular individual who's had COVID-19, basically how strong their immune response was and how protected they're likely to be. There was a study uh, conducted in, in, in Kentucky that showed that individuals who had prior COVID-19 were at twice the risk of reinfection compared to individuals who were fully vaccinated. So that kind of captures that, I think it's just that variability in magnitude and duration following natural infection. Thanks, Bill. And, and Brian, how, how do you talk about this with, with patients who are coming to you um, with similar questions? Yeah, no, I, I think I, Bill, Bill's uh, point is a really good one. You know, we do recommend that everyone gets vaccinated, even if they've had COVID before. It's, it's really hard to know what their immune response would have been to the infection that they had. Uh, depending on when they got infected, it may be a different variant than circulating right now, and that may or may not have produced as robust an immune response as the vaccine. And we also know from not just from the data that Bill mentioned in COVID, but from many other types of viral infections that the immunity that's that you derive from a vaccine is stronger and longer lasting than it is from natural infection. And so I think my advice to patients is, you know, there's a lot of COVID circulating around right now. The only way we get out of this pandemic is by getting vaccinated. The best way to protect yourself from reinfection and to protect those around you is to get vaccinated, even if you've been uh, infected previously with COVID. Thanks, Brian. Jennifer, several questions coming in about variants. And of course, we've all been talking about Delta for, for weeks, but what else is out there and, and what, if any, variants should we be paying attention to? Well, I, we should still be paying attention to Delta because it's in our midst and it is what um, we are currently very much battling. Of course, there is still a need for improved surveillance for variants. We know that not all countries are doing equal amounts of sequencing, which is required to identify and track these variants. So working to improve um, the amount of sequencing that's done is important. But once the countries are doing that, I mean, I think there's a fairly robust process to keep tabs on the variants that are being detected and to try to understand um, what additional concerns, if any, they, they pose. So far, nothing in my mind has really um, raised to the same level of concern that I have for Delta, given the very um, uh, clear ability of Delta to outcompete other variants and its continued circulation, its um, enhanced uh, transmissibility. Um, but, you know, I, I think there are other um, variants that, you know, may um, just be worth watching. But at this point, I want everybody to remain focused on the virus that's in front of us. Understood. Thanks, Jennifer. Brian, question for you. Where do things stand with um, research and treatment options for so-called uh, long-haul COVID? Well, you know, there's a lot of, of time, money, and effort being invested in this because there are obviously millions of people at risk for having, um, you know, post-acute and you know, sequelae from their COVID infection. What's still unclear is how much of what we're seeing in patients who haven't gotten back to their pre-COVID baseline, how much of this is specific to COVID, how much of this is part of a response to a viral infection. We've seen similar episodes like this before with H1N1 in 2009, with pandemic influenza in 1918. There are many people who never really quite get back to their baseline status after a viral infection. Um, it's likely that post-COVID is a number of different conditions. People experience different symptoms ranging anywhere from neurologic symptoms, brain fog, fatigue, to, to respiratory symptoms in patients who had severe lung disease like cough, shortness of breath, or, or inability to exercise the way that they once did. Um, right now, the best treatment for long COVID is to not get COVID. Mm -hmm. And so vaccines are really the best way to, to try to tackle this problem. And, and you know, I think that's an important message for people who haven't been infected yet. Um, 
unfortunately, we don't have a clear therapeutic option for people who do have long COVID. Um, but many centers around the country, including Johns Hopkins, have set up these multidisciplinary post-COVID clinics where patients can have access to lung doctors and neurologists and physical therapists and, um, you know, folks who, you know, who can handle all the different symptoms that people have. And, and right now we think the best way forward is a multidisciplinary approach, continue to, to try to study and understand what these different symptoms are. Um, and hopefully that will lead to some insights into how we can prevent it in people who do get COVID. But as importantly, how can we treat some of these symptoms in people who still haven't returned back to their baseline? Thanks, Brian. Jennifer, in your opening remarks, you talked about testing and, and the state of testing. So do you see a, a path and what might the, the time frame be for daily inexpensive testing? Does, does FDA have to do something different to make this happen? Sure. So um, a lot of news today about um, FDA's um, authorization of um, yet another rapid test um, and the uh, production estimates from the company suggest that by December we could um, have an additional 200 million rapid tests per month. Um, that of, is a you know a great um, improvement over the supplies that we currently have. If you've tried to get a rapid test recently, you'll you'll know that they are basically impossible to come by. So um, having more tools like this is um, absolutely uh, critical, and it is encouraging that we have this development. That said, if you um, have a vision that you know most Americans are going to use these tools to test themselves every few days, 200 tests per month is not even close to what we would need in order to implement that. And so um, there are some that argue that the holdup is really the level of uh, scrutiny that the FDA gives and that they are using um, criteria that have been established for diagnostic tests, tests that are supposed to guide clinical treatment of individuals, um, which is a fairly high bar. Um, and that that perhaps is the wrong bar for, for these rapid tests that um, perhaps are best used as a public health assessment tool to, to identify people that may be contagious. Um, I will just say that I don't fully think um, we just ignore the FDA on this issue because also in the news as of late was a test that was ultimately recalled um, due to a number of, of false positive uh, uh, test results. Um, which you know may not have um, dangerous consequences for patients. Though if you're someone who's tested positive and then later discovered that that was not a real positive and you've missed work or other things, um, that's probably um, has some cost to you personally. It also potentially reduces confidence in these tests. So I do think that um, a regulatory oversight is important for maintaining confidence and for making sure that the results from these tests are actionable. Could we speed up the process? I think that there probably is a middle path here um, that considers how these tests are to be used and that tries to minimize the negative consequences of a false or um, positive or negative test result by perhaps um, suggesting some level of, of follow-up in, in, um, in particular circumstances. But um, there's also, I think, a production issue. We know that some of these companies that um, made tests wound up destroying tests over the summer because they weren't being used. We have to treat these tests like strategic tools where um, just because there isn't a demand now doesn't mean there won't be a demand in a few months. And we need to make sure we have a, enough of a stockpile of them such that we don't ever again experience the critical shortages that we're experiencing right now. Thanks, Jennifer. Bill, several questions coming in about boosters. So I'm, I'm going to give them to you on a common theme. So, so the, the first is right now, who should be thinking about getting a booster? Yes, so the the FDA authorized and the CDC made recommendations, both uh, groups, uh, you know, informed by their advisory committees. Um, and so the CDC, current CDC recommendations are that booster doses should be given to two groups of people, and I'll describe it, and then may be given to two additional groups of people. So the people who should be getting uh, booster doses, and I, I, I need to preface this, these are individuals who receive two doses of Pfizer vaccine and the booster doses with a Pfizer vaccine. This does not yet apply uh, to folks who receive the either the Moderna or, or J and J vaccine. So individuals older than 65 years and older and residents of long-term care facilities, according to the CDC, should receive a booster dose. And adults 50 to 64 years of age who have an underlying medical condition that places them at high risk 
uh, for severe COVID-19. Those are the two groups for whom the CDC recommends booster doses. Now, there are two additional groups uh, for which the CDC says these individuals can get a booster dose based on an individual assessment of benefit and risk. Now, that's, that's complex uh, to operationalize that, um, but one group are individual or adults 18 to 49 years of age with an underlying medical condition that places them at, at risk of severe COVID-19, and individuals 18 to 64 who are at high risk of exposure uh, because of their occupation or the institution in which they work or live. So that's a quite broad um, set of, of recommendations when you look across those, those four uh, key populations. Thanks, Bill. And, and as a follow-up to something that you mentioned, that, that everything that you just said applied to those who received two doses of Pfizer initially, <laughs> What's the thinking for those who received um, Moderna or or J and J? Is the advice to just sit tight relative to boosters? Yes, this is a this is a, a difficult situation for many individuals, I, and I understand that. Um, so both uh, Moderna and Johnson and Johnson or Janssen have uh, conducted studies looking at booster doses, and we expect next week the advisory committee to the FDA to be reviewing these data um, and making their recommendations on whether the FDA should authorize use uh, or authorize booster doses for these additional vaccines. So um, I understand the, the concern, I would say, particularly for individuals who've received a single dose of Johnson & Johnson um, and their desire to get a booster dose. Um, my advice would be to wear your mask, be careful, practice the public health uh, measures, um, and hopefully we'll be getting uh, both authorization and recommendations in the coming weeks on booster doses for those other vaccines. Thanks so much, Bill, and no surprise, many vaccine questions coming in, so I'm going to stay with you for this next one. And th this concerns research that, that you and your colleagues have done. What do we know are the best strategies to address fears or hesitancy related to getting a COVID vaccination? Yes, it, it, I wish there were a simple answer to this, but it is a very complex one. And the first thing is to understand that there's, uh, that there's a spectrum uh, of, uh, of vaccine hesitancy or resistance and that the uh, the reasons underlying this uh, are, are multiple and complex as well. So I would say the simple strategies are first uh, to listen uh, to what uh, the concerns are um, and, and try as best as possible to understand them. Um, if it's due to misinformation or disinformation, um, having the, the right messenger convey that information to the target audience is really critical. And that's a, a, tr a person who the community or individual trusts, whether that's a, a religious leader or a celebrity, a sports figure. So it, it's, it's understanding the underlying concerns and reasons for vaccine hesitancy um, and having targeted messages with the right messenger would be a, kind of the, the simplest form for addressing that. Thanks, Bill. Jennifer, question for you. Are we past a point now where we can um, realistically think about eradication of COVID-19? Yes. I mean, I, I um, let me just say, I don't think this virus was ever suitable for that goal. Um, we have criteria that we use to um, help determine if um, a pathogen is capable of eradication, which means basically eliminating it from natural circulation on the planet, or elimination, which means um, reducing it to, to very, very low levels. Um, certainly on the eradication front, I just, I, there are many attributes to um, this virus that I uh, don't make it suitable um, for eradication. Um, some countries have um, pursued elimination strategies where they've taken very, very aggressive control measures in the, with the goals of trying to keep the case numbers down. Um, I will tell you, I have long been sort of skeptical that that would ultimately be a successful approach because of many attributes of this virus that make it hard to control at that level. Um, and including the vaccines that we have, perhaps not providing um, as much protection against um, 
uh, uh, you know, at any level of, of cases as perhaps we've we've seen with, with other vaccines. Um, but I will tell you increasingly countries that have been pursuing elimination strategies are abandoning those strategies. So the most, I think, high profile one was just yesterday, uh, maybe it was yesterday, R this week, uh, New Zealand, which has you know garnered global um, attention for being able to control and keep to a very low levels um, its COVID cases, but have, having done so at very considerable cost in terms of um, uh, tourism and, 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 and economic um, uh, activity um, is as basically decided they're going to move away from that strategy. And, you know, they've, they've been able to, to take advantage of the low levels. They have not had um, anywhere near the level of deaths that the United States have and now can use vaccines to avert those deaths. But I think it mean, what it means is that they're going to have to um, start um, tolerating a certain number of cases, um, but fo remain focused on preventing hospitalizations and deaths. Thanks, Jennifer. And I, um, knowing that you were likely to give an answer along those lines, I have um, a next question. I'm going to ask each of you, all four of you, to weigh in from your respective area of expertise. And so the, the question is, how can policymakers best prepare for a future that includes COVID-19? Um, and I'll, I'll go I'll go around the, the Zoom. So, uh, Beth, why don't, why don't you start? I think the, the, there's been a, a skill that's been sharpened over the course of this pandemic, which is the capacity of policy makers and leaders to actually use data to inform decision making. And so if we were to emphasize anything um, as we think about what a long term strategy is to, to live in, in thriving communities where COVID is still um, part of our lives um, is to continue to sharpen that skill and to continue to work with your public health systems to identify uh, high priority data, to align that data to critical decision making, and to continue to share that data uh, responsibly with the public so that we can also guide our individual and family based decisions. Thanks, Beth. Bill, same question. How can policymakers best prepare for a future with COVID 19? Yes, and I, I can. I completely agree with what Beth said and the, the use of accurate and timely data and, and standardized data. Uh, I'll, I'll put on my vaccine, vaccinologist hat. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the, for me, the biggest tragedy of this last wave in the United States has been the fact that some of our healthcare systems, our hospitals have been overwhelmed. We should just not be in that position. And so we are going to have to live with this virus. But what we want to do is, is prevent a, a severe disease. We want to present, prevent hospitalizations and deaths, and our best tool for, the, for doing that is the vaccine. Thanks, Bill. Brian, same question. So I think we need to even look beyond just the current COVID um, crisis that we're in and, and think about how we can take the lessons that, that we're hearing about and apply them to getting prepared for the next infectious disease threat. You know, we've now seen in the last 20 years, three novel coronaviruses that have each caused progressively more severe levels of, of disease and global impact. And as we've you know, seen our economies and our societies encroach on the environment, you know, the, the rate at which pathogens are able to spread from animal hosts uh, into humans is accelerating. And this is unfortunately probably not going to be the last, you know, serious infectious disease threat that we see on a national or global scale in the next several decades. And so I think we also need to begin thinking about how we're going to bolster our surveillance, not just for COVID, but for other infectious diseases, how we're going to rebuild our national stockpiles to have countermeasures, but also effective personal protective equipment, how we're going to figure out a, you know, a national system of special pathogen care where we can better allocate resources across the country, as opposed to having just you know local and, and state level responses where you know, we, we've seen individual health systems or communities become overwhelmed by these infections. I think we need to learn from those lessons, continue to apply them in COVID, but recognize that we need to do this because this is not going to be the last infectious disease threat we face in the coming years. Thanks, Brian. And Jennifer, you're going to get the last word in this briefing. What do you think? How should policymakers best prepare for a future with COVID-19? 
Well, I referenced uh, the change in New Zealand. And I think what's notable about that is not that they changed course, but that they actually have a strategy, that they are articulating what they are working towards. And that is something that we don't have here in the United States and that a number of other countries don't have. They haven't defined what the end goals are. They haven't um, developed a strategy for meeting those end goals. They haven't decided what tools are needed, which ones, how to optimize the use of the tools that we have, what metrics we're going to use to gauge success, and how will we know when it's over. This is really critical because I will tell you in all of the conversations we've had, I've had lots of people say it feels like the goalposts keep shifting. We have asked people to do extraordinary things and people have by and large um, stepped up. But if we want to continue to work with people, to engage with them as partners in this work, we have to let them know what we're all marching towards. And so while I don't think that um, there is a COVID free future um, ahead of us. I very much would welcome to see what our future um, is going to look like defined by the decision makers um, and, and a clear strategy for getting there and to, for gauging when we will be there. Thanks, Jennifer. And with that, I'm going to wrap up this briefing. I'd like to thank our panelists, Jennifer Nezzo, Bill Moss, Brian Garibaldi, and Beth Lauer for joining me today. And a big thank you to everyone who joined us and especially to those who submitted questions. This briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. And while we did try to cover as many questions as we could today, for those um, who are still looking for answers, there's a wealth of information on our website, coronavirus.jhu.edu. We also have a weekly newsletter called The Week in COVID-19 delivered on Mondays with the latest information and analysis from our experts about the virus itself, variants, and other critical trends. Finally, we offer similar briefings to this one every Friday at noon where we do have live Q&A with our experts. So we'll look forward to seeing you at our next Johns Hopkins Congressional Briefing. And until then, thanks and stay safe.